Father, we thank you so much, God, for your brand new mercies, God, that we get to experience today. We pray, God, that as we're in this day, God, that every person that comes in today will have a mind to receive from you today. No matter what state we come in, God, we pray, God, that by the time we leave out, it will be greater and better. We thank you for your word, God, that transforms our lives, that heals our spirits, God, and elevates our souls. Today, God, we pray that you use vessels, oh God, to glorify your name and bless your people in the house. We thank you so much, God, for your glory. We thank you so much, God, for just allowing us to be a part of this experience. In yes, Jesus' God. name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit because so I, as our people trickle in, but um, I want to start off by just saying <clears throat> that, you know, we live in a generation now where uh, it's, it's a little bit more relaxed than from when, I, I feel like I'm getting older now when I say stuff like this, but it's a little bit more relaxed from uh, as I grew up. <clears throat> you know, not even before I came into the church, you know, I grew up and uh, here it is, I feel like I'm getting older because I get to repeat certain stories. Uh, but you know, when I grew up, my mom um, raised us as a single mother and raising two boys I don't think that was an easy feat for her, but she I think she did a pretty decent job. Uh, but the thing about her, my mom was very, what, old school, as we call it. She was a, uh, a person, she was a disciplinarian uh, and a nurturer. And I say that because, um, you know, my mother, um, when I was younger, she uh, broke her hip and she was also diagnosed with cancer. And so the majority of my life, I only remember my mother being sick and laying in the bed uh, in a wheelchair, having to move her around and I would have to do things for her. But in that part, uh, you know, I, I uh, say that she laid a good foundation of discipline because even from the bed, my brother and I knew she couldn't get up, you know. So as boys, you know, if we were running functions, that could be something that we could have taken advantage of and just, you know, did anything we wanted to do and just, be knuckleheads, uh, but she had disciplined us so much that her voice um, was able to keep us in line. So when she spoke to us and said certain things, we believed her. You know, sometimes when we did do certain things, she would say something like, boy, I get out this bed and beat you. And, um, and so in our mind, you know, I guess we had faith because we believed she would rise and be healed and come and get us. And so, you know, we would just straighten up because of what she said. Um, and because of, the, like I said, the foundation of how she raised us. And a lot of times, we, you know, when parents, we don't realize that as we're raising our children, that um, a lot of the things that they do spill over into us, uh, spill over into the children. Um, because even as my mom, you know, I came from that generation also that my mom, uh, we had play shoes and we had school shoes. And so when you came home, you had to take off your school shoes and put on the play shoes to go outside. We had school clothes and we had play clothes. Um, and so um, not everybody was like that because I remember going outside and seeing some of my friends having on the clothes that they wore to school. And for some reason, I was a little envious. I'm like, how come you get to wear your school clothes outside? Uh, but I didn't get a chance to wear my school clothes outside. I had to put on those regular play clothes. Uh, and then we had my brother and I, because it was two of us, we had assigned days to clean the kitchen. You know, uh, I would clean on certain days, he would clean on certain days. Um, and then we also had this assigned days uh, where we had to clean the house. And so we cleaned the house, you know, it was like days, we like maybe it was on a Saturday, you know, it's been so long ago, I forget which day it was, but maybe it was a Saturday where we did a deep cleaning in the house, you know, you scrub the bathroom, you scrub the floors and wash, all this other kind of stuff you did. Uh, but I remember, you know, getting fussed at because my room would be dirty a lot of times. And I'm thinking like, how come my room be dirty, you know, like this? So anyway, you know, my mother passed away when I was 10. So you think about it, all that went on from the time I was, what, four or five years old until uh, 10. So we're talking only about five or six years of her being able to uh, instill that type of thing inside of me uh, because the time was short. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I remember when I came down to live with my father and uh, his wife at the time, God knew Mr. Hank, uh, live with her, a lot of the things that she put on the inside of me was still there. But because some of it wasn't enforced 
like she did, you know, you start trying to get away with little things and do things a little bit differently. And I remember um, he would always, and I'm, it's hard to teach and preach without putting your business in the streets. Right. But, uh, you know, I remember as I was younger, you know, my dad would come and fuss at me like, come and clean this room. It's stinking here. Uh, you know, he would say all type of stuff like this, come and clean this room up and all this other kind of thing. But I'm thinking, you know, being raised like I was, you know, I should have known better. But, you know, again, as you get older, and especially when I got my first house, guess how my house was? Spot. It was clean. <laughs> Anybody that knows me that ever been in my house, I'm a clean person. I, I like to be clean. Uh, it makes me feel comfortable. I love to clean my house, light a candle, and the... Don't nobody ever have to come. I do it for me because I like to feel that peace, so I like to feel that way. And I just like to have that that ambience, if you will, of just being like uh, clean. So I remember, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember me and Shelly having a conversation because when I was single, she was saying, when you have kids, it's gonna change. And I'm like, no it ain't. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show them that, you know. And of course, you know, little kids, they leave stuff everywhere. And, you know, but as a parent, what I was taught began to trickle down. So because I became a disciplinarian as well, my kids learned how to cook my own. If you walk in my kids' room today, it is a reflection of how I was when I was younger. <laughs> I'll tell everybody, you can go in any parts of my house, just don't go in my kids' room. <laughs> don't go in my kids' room because it is, I'm going somewhere with this, but because it is chaotic. I walk in my kids' room and I'm looking, I look, I just stop and I look like, for real? How do you even function in this? How, what did, and I just clean this room. And you just have these old moments of being like this. So that's how I was raised and a lot of that stuff just passed down to me. And because I say that I was, uh, you know, raised that type of way, I have a lot of the, what we call maybe old school ways in me or disciplinary in me. And you heard me say this a lot. I, I, uh, I was the type of person that was raised by a mother. She didn't like to repeat herself when she said something, she meant it. Uh, she was the one of the type of person that when she promised you a whooping, you could count on it. It was not one of those type of, you know how some of the younger generation, they said they're going to whip you, and they just talk, 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 and it's never nothing happened at all. When she said it, you just go in and start crying now because it was coming. I, would, I remember uh, certain days we would be in church, and she had that look in the choir stand. She would look out there, and that look on her face, tears just start rolling from your face because you just know you're going to get it. You go home, and you start trying to clean up and do all the good stuff, you know, trying to make the moment right. Maybe she'll forget, and you may do one thing wrong. Go get me that belt. <laughs> you know, you just go through all these kind of moments, but that's just how it was going there, doing that kind of stuff. And so, um, when I came here to church, First United Gospel Assembly, believe it or not, we were a lot more disciplined than we are now. There was a lot more, if you allow me to use this word, a little bit more strictness going on. And the reason I say it like that, we had also had people that was a little bit more uh, cooperative, <laughs> that honored and respected leadership a lot more. So when they said certain things, there was not a lot of pushback. And so we just yielded to the, the structure of what was in the house. And so I was raised that type of way, raised uh, and believing just how I was being taught. They said, I remember uh, in our younger days, you know, I, I remember when I hung out even with the saints, they didn't even like to take aspirin because they believed that God was going to heal them. And, um, they didn't like to, you know, I remember we, we didn't watch Martin, uh, uh, what were some of those other shows, the Bart Simpsons, uh, and live, I used to love and live in color. Some of y'all may not remember that, but you know, when we came here, that was a lot of no, no, no. But all these things began to, you know, it was almost like, I'm gonna be honest with y'all, you know, even though we say, I, I remember, I remember my brother, it's like we used to sneak and watch him leave and cover sometimes. And we, we grown people. We grown. <laughs> With our home place, but you know, but it was a part of the discipline that it was something that you just shouldn't do. But I remember we kind of like weaning ourselves off of this type of stuff. Uh, I remember someone uh, talked to my brother about his haircut, certain type of haircut, and things that we wore, and all these other types of things. And it was just stuff that we yielded to, it was because uh, we felt the anointing, we felt the presence of God, and we wanted, I, let me just speak for myself, I didn't speak for my brother, I wanted that, and so I believed that whatever it was gonna take then, 
hey, let's do it. Let's just do this type of thing. I wasn't perfect, God knows, in a lot of these things, but it was some of the structure that was given and some of the things that were falling in line. And so it was a part of how it, it was just a part of how I was being taught and things like that. And so I noticed that in our church world, not even only in here, but just across the land, that that type of discipline is not there, or even if it's that, if it is there, it's not received, and it's, people don't yield to that type of thing because I am grown. You're not gonna tell me what to do. You know how you gonna, you know how you put on your pants the same way I put on my type of pants, and then we expect, you know, this heavy weight of God to fall in the place when we can't even yield to our leadership if we can't trust them to give us the guidelines to live a certain type of life, how can we trust them to pour into us? You know, it has to be both ways. Either you're going to trust or not. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> and so um, in doing that and understanding that type of way, um, and I'm just going to say this for me, this is why I have certain type of convictions in my life is because how I was raised. Even though I may have fallen off in some areas, and even though, you know, you said, you know to do right, you know what to do in order to have certain things. I know how to get into the presence of the Lord. I know what it takes. And so it takes, catch this word, it takes discipline. This is why Jesus called his disciples disciples. They were disciplined people. Does that make sense? And so it has to be disciplined people. And so even as in, in growing up in church, and growing up in this ways, you know, you hear a lot of church rhetorics that I won't say just necessarily in here, but watching television throughout just the body of Christ, you hear a lot of fancy things that people may have said. Some of these things may be adorned, and some of these just become hype. You know, when people would say, you know, touch your neighbor and tell them you're coming out of this, and you know, you know, spin around three times and you know, walk forward, and you're gonna walk out of this circumstance and situation. You know, and if you be anything like me, or you be honest. You know, you may be caught in those emotions and things like that, but you know, you may feel the presence of God or whatever, but you have those moments, but you go right back to the same life or you go back to that same whatever you came in with. Anybody ever been, I'm just telling myself, anybody, oh, I see you shaking your head. But you know, you have those type of moments like that. And it's because, you know, even as I thought about these things, you know, like, what is it, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite scriptures, and we're going to talk about it again, but one of my favorite scriptures in, is in the book of Jude when it says, uh, to the one who's able to keep us from falling. You know, and when I read that many, many, many years ago, I'm like, well, God, help me change shoes or something. I keep sleeping and sliding and falling. You know, help a brother out. You know, uh, but in life, I want us to be able to understand this Sunday school today, so we're just talking to teachers. Uh, in, in life, I want us to understand that God has equipped the church, the body of Christ with many gifts and many ministry gifts, right? Um, he's equipped us with the ability of gifts to be able to edify the church. Uh, gifts to be able to perfect the church, you know, because we all have our flaws. The church has the flaws, and so we have gifts to help us perfect the church. We have gifts to encourage us, you know, when things may happen and we just need that encouragement. We have gifts to, to be able to encourage, uh, gifts to help us be victorious in life. We have those type of gifts. In fact, the Bible tells us uh, and teaches us that in your Bible and in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Bible talks about how he gives us the power to get wealth. And so Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, the Bible says he gives us the power to get wealth. And so in our lives, if we were not raised with the mentality of how to handle our finances and how to handle money, because I was not raised in that avenue or with the knowledge of how to handle money, but the Bible teaches us that he gives us power to get wealth. And how many of you understand that you can get wealth, but the thing is, how do you keep it? And so we can get wealth, but we have to have the knowledge and we have to have the understanding of how to obtain and keep the wealth. And so God has given us people to teach us how to keep the wealth. And not only how to get it, but how to keep it and what we should do in those type of circumstances and situations. But how many of you understand that, you know, we can get money. And then a week or two later, a month later, we back broke again, right? 
And so I forgot to say this part a little bit early, just to keep that in mind. But I, I do remember, like I told you, Mama told us to clean the house. And so, of course, like I said, I like to keep my house clean. And so um, my life is real hectic right now. You know, I'm working, taking care. Uh, you know, y'all know, I, I just got a lot going on. And so I, I'm not able to do a lot like I used to, but it's just me, so I don't mess up a whole lot. But sometimes things get out, but then I have a cleaning day where I come and clean. And then I noticed that it may take me hours to do that. But in like seconds, minutes, it gets messed back up. You know, my kids come in and they just, you know, and I'm like, get in here, get in my stupid, you know, because they'll, you know, leave. I don't like dishes left in the sink. I don't want you. We got a dishwasher. I'm like, if you're not gonna wash it, put them in the dishwasher, you know. So I'm like, why are you leaving this on the counter? I'm like, who? No, I just stopped. Her. I said, now help me understand this. I'm just, I'm real animated. Help me understand this. There's only four of us in the house. You know, Papa, I'm not gonna clean it. So if you don't know who you think gonna do it. I'm never cleaning up, I'm getting in. You know, I go through these whole little, get back in and clean this stuff. I spent all this time cleaning my kitchen up. You know, so I go through these, but I feel this why I'm mad now. Like, get back in and clean my kitchen up. And I'm like, I spent all these hours coming and cleaning, and you come in in seconds, and it's like a hurricane that's coming here. You know, I have pillars on my couch. Thank you, Miss Angel. I have pillars on my couch, and they just come and throw the pillars and have them all. They have blankets. I'm like, they leave. I'm like, they go back. And I be like, they did this to me when I was young. It could be 2 o'clock in the morning. I come in and see, get down here and put this blanket. And I make them do it because I want them to feel the pain of leaving this blanket on my couch and knowing I'm going to come and get you this girl. They did it to me. I remember being woke up 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning come and clean the kitchen because they told me to do it early and I didn't do it. They would wake me up. So, you know, it passed down. So, whew, I had to get that off my chest. A confessional boss, he can be healed. But I said that to say, back to where I was at, is that when God tells us about the power to get wealth and we find ourselves back in that situation again because we don't know how to handle money. And not only that, the Bible teaches us, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures, you can write them down and just listen. In Isaiah 53 and 5, where it says, He was wounded for our transgressions, He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we were healed. And so he has given us the power. Uh, he's given us the gift of healing in our life. He's given us the gift of healing uh, in our physical bodies, uh, healing us from our sinful nature. You know, so we're calling iniquities or calling our sin. He's given us the ability to be cleansed from that and to be healed from that uh, because of what he's been through. Uh, here's the scripture I told you about, one of my favorite in Jude 1 and 24. He's a keeper now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and present us, now check this part out, present us faultless before the Father. Now when I read that many years ago, that was just something that was wonderful because, you know, being a person like me, I'm like, I have too many faults. So you telling me that you have the ability to get all this stuff out of me? So he's able to present us faultless before God. So take you back to my cleaning days. You ever have those times when you're cleaning and it's just this one spot that some stuff you can just spray a little bleach or something on it and wipe it off. But there's some stuff you need a Brillo pad. You need to get it. Sometimes you got to get a chisel and something just scrape some stuff that may be ever stuck on the floor. It don't come up just as easy. And so some of that time I felt like that's how God had to do me. You know, some stuff needed a Brillo pad and some stuff needed a chisel to help clean it. And it don't feel good. And it doesn't feel wonderful to go through those process, but if he's going to present me faultless before the Father, it's something that I had to yield, yield to in order for him to do, and still yield it to for him to do. Amen? Um, in your Bible also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, uh, he's an escape route for us. The Bible talks about, now there is no temptation taking you, but such is coming to man. But God, who is faithful, will not only suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with temptations also make a way to escape 
that you may be able to bear it. So he's a escape route. So there's maybe things that God knows that we're going to be tempted. So he's given us ways to get out. He's given us an opportunity to get out of those temptations in order for us to be free again. Right? Even the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians um, that, I mean, sorry, in, in James chapter 1 and 4 that uh, when we are tempted, we are drawn away by our own lust. So it's not something that he does, but we're drawn away because we have things on the inside of us that we are tempted by that causes us to want to go out. We're enticed by our own lust, our own desires. But even when those type of things happen, we have ways to get out of it. Amen. And so these are some of the, the things that God has done. So why in the world am I bringing this up? All these, I'm just showing you that even when we get in trouble, that God doesn't want us to stay there. He gives us avenues to stay there, and he gives us escape routes to get out. Amen? In John 10 and 10, one of Minister Pruitt's favorite scripture, uh, so we know that the thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have that life more abundantly. So here's where we get into the nitty gritty of the matter. So God gives us all of these benefits of being, and there's so many more, thousands and thousands more. But the thing that I really want to capitalize on in today is that God has given us all these things. He's given us all these gifts. You know, we lay hands to, to own the sick. We're able to help speak deliverance and create an atmosphere of worship and praise. But if anybody would confess and anybody would be real, you can walk out of church and by noon, by evening time, before you nightfall hit, you feel yourself right back in captivity. You feel yourself right back in trouble. You turn it right back into the same circumstance and situation. What do we do in order to keep that? And so I just want to be the one to tell you, not because I'm from a judgment place, but from an experience place. There's no easy way. There's no blow and you just set sail it for life. There's no lay hands on you and speak in tongues, shanda bahaya, and you just free forever. There is a work that has to be done by the individual in order to maintain that type of strength in your soul in order for us to stay free and even to have an atmosphere of glory. Now, when you begin to think about glory, you know, we use that word so loosely in the church that it just seems like this little, you know, hey, pass me a shirt. <laughs> you know, God let your shirt fall in the room. No, it's not like that. But when you think about glory, if you will go back into the Old Testament where God's glory, the real glory came, people feared and trembled. When God told them to meet me at Mount Zion, he told them three days ahead of time, four days ahead of time, look, I need you to prepare yourself because I'm going to come down and meet you. And I don't want you to sleep with your wives, don't touch no unclean things, and don't even let your animals come near the mountain because I'm going to break forth and kill you if anything that's not like me hit this mountain. And so the people, in fears and trembling, they prepared themselves, they sanctified themselves just to come to hear the voice of the Lord talk to them. And he, they understood that if they came unprepared, that it was their literal physical life at stake. Because I need you to understand that the Bible talks about God will not share his glory with anybody, that you're never going to see his face. You're not going to, uh, he's not going to allow this, you know, it's not that he hates the person, but he hates the sin. So he's not going to allow these types of things. I remember reading historical things that even the Levites during that particular time, when it came time to atone for the sins of Israel. Israel, they didn't sleep for days in the fear of them having a dream that was unpurified and they were coming to the holy place and die. And so you think we in the church now are saying, God, send your glory, and we live any type of life. We have any type of thing going on, and we say, God, send your glory. You know, and so what God is doing is trying to allow us to be prepared. For that, because we understand that the Bible talks about how he's coming back for a church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. And so in order to do that, just like I feel like with my kids coming to my house, 
And I spent all this time cleaning it. And in seconds, they come and mess it up. I can just picture God telling me, clean it up. I just got through washing you. I just got through cleansing you. And you're going to come in here and throw the pillars all over the place. Right? And so we have responsibilities to stay free. That means I can't say what I want to say. I'm grown, yeah. But in God's, I'm his child. And so that means I can't have certain... Because, let me just use me. Because of the anointing that's on my life and because of the presence that's on my life and how God wants to use me and how I want him to use, I can't have certain conversations. You may have the liberty to have them. And so I can't come to God and say, well, they doing it. Why can't I? No, it's because of what he's doing with me. I'm not allowed to have certain some conversations. I'm not allowed to do certain things. Even just like Paul says, he said, I'm not a liberty to do certain things, but at the cause, I don't offend you. I don't want to offend you, and I don't want to offend God. Because you have to understand that when he entrusts you with glory, when he entrusts you with his anointing, that's not something that's light. You understand? You can't treat it like a rag dog. You can't treat him like just anything. But he wants to be able to trust us with presence and with power. And so you think about it. This is me. If I want God to use me, I don't want my life to be just subpar. But if I want God to use me to help destroy yokes from people's lives, if I want God to help use me to break the, the, the trauma of the enemy in the lives of God's people, that's a responsibility that I have that my life does not belong to me. So just because I feel like doing it doesn't give me the right to do it when I'm trying to be used by God. Is this making sense to you? And so when I'm saying, God, I want you to do this, and then so I can't do certain things that will tamper or taint the anointing that, the anointing that God puts on my life. Does that make sense to you? And so, so certain responsibilities. And so there are some things, especially as we begin to mature in the Lord, as we begin to grow, there are certain things that, uh, you know, we, how can I put it? You know, we want God to come and, oh, we want somebody to come. Let me just go to the altar, let Bishop or Lady Rankin lay hands on me and get this stuff out of me. No, let me give you a scripture reference what I'm talking about. Uh, the Bible talks about in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 5. I'm trying to talk slow so I can, you know, how much time I got. I got about 15 more minutes on I talk fast sometimes. I listen to myself talk sometimes or preach. That is torture. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so sorry, y'all, because I talk fast. I get excited. And in my head, it makes sense. But, you know, so I'm going to calm down so we can get this. So in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says, Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now, what does that scripture say again? Deliver thyself. It don't say, shepherd, come and deliver me. Pastor, come and deliver me. Shelly, can you sing and I get delivered? You know, Pastor Ramon, can you come and lay hand? No, deliver thyself. Get yourself out of this circumstance, which is empowering because, therefore, the scripture is telling me that God has put something on the inside of me that gives me the power that even when the enemy captures me, that I can get out of it. This is why it's important for us to hear the word. This is why word studies are important. This is why your personal devotion is important. This is why you fellowshipping and saying the right things with the saints are important. Because you begin to empower your spirit that even when the enemy comes, there's something on the inside of your nature, your God-given nature, that gives you the power to get out. Now, if I don't want to come out or if I'm taking a lazy approach, then I just lay there and say, oh, my God, I'm so tired of being in this situation. Every time I get out of this, it just seems like I'm getting back in here. Don't nobody want to come help me. Everybody just want nobody to be there for me. They want nobody. To, you know, we get in this little pity party. So let me help you understand this. What gave the pastor the power to get you out? What gave the first lady the power to get you out of the circumstance? Sorry. What gave you the, 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 the first lady or the, anybody getting? That means you count on their discipline, their sacrifice. They're turning down their plate. They're disciplined in order. So what makes them different and you can't have the same thing for yourself in life? Right? That means there's a price that is being paid by them in order for you to have it because you can't get to the pastors all the time. You know, I pastor them. 
They don't give out their phone number to anybody like that. You can't call them at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning like that. I don't even want y'all to do that. I really, I don't even want to see y'all call me. But this is why this ministry teaches us about having personal relationships with God. Amen? Okay, if y'all don't believe that one. In your Bible, let's, 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 let's look at this. In your Bible, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, I should have read this one first, but anyway. The Bible talks about, this is Paul talking to the Philippian church. He says, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more by my absence, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. Here he says, Paul is saying, Work out your own soul salvation. You do it. You work it out. And here's the part that Paul was saying. He said, look, while I'm here in the church, y'all able to keep this stuff. Y'all able to be good while I'm here. Y'all can follow the scriptures. You can, you can listen to everything I'm saying. You're living right while you're in the church. But when I leave, when ain't nobody else around, I need you to do the same thing. I need you to while you're around, pooking them and they name them, act like I'm still here and live right. And this is where we mess up. Because if the pastor's not around, if we're not in the, let me ask y'all this. I heard somebody say this many years ago, you know, because sometimes in the church we act like we got the can't help us. You know, it's just like, I can't help myself. It seems like I'm, every time I'm here, I'm always falling in here and I'm always doing something. I got no business doing it. I can't. But, you know, the thing about it is if you just take about five seconds, and realize that right now you're not doing what you say you can't stop doing? One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five. So you see what I'm saying? You kept yourself, right? You kept yourself saved for five seconds. You kept yourself saved. You ain't cussed nobody out. You live right. You ain't drink. You ain't smoke. You ain't sexing nobody up. You, for five seconds, you kept yourself. You disciplined your spirit. So that means Paul says that when you leave the church, when you leave from the congregations of the saints, that means that same power that kept you for them five seconds, I need you to keep them while you're at home. But you don't understand it ain't the same way y'all up in here. You know, you got prayer in church. Well, you need to change your environment. Is your soul important enough for you to change the environment? Same man chair, not the like the old people do. <laughs> but I'm saying this like I told you. I'm saying this from experience. I'm not saying this being such a much, but this is the kind of stuff that I fought with. This kind of stuff I have to deal with my own self is that in order for me to be free, in order for me to stay free, I have to change environments. I have to change conversations. I have to change certain things in life in order to have a life with the anointed. The way that I want God to use me to have that type of experience with him, there are certain things that I just cannot do. There are certain things I just can't say. I have certain things I can't touch. There are certain, it just can't. It's just one of those things. Amen? And it is a ever growing and learning and doing in our lives in order for us to have that. Amen? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, verse chapter 25, and 28. The Bible says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now, for those of you that may not understand that, you know, even during biblical times, especially in the Old Testament, they built walls to protect them from their enemies when they were at war with one another. And so when the enemy was to come in, they had to, they had to come past the wall in order to get to them. And so if that wall was breached or if that wall was torn down, so then their enemies had access to them and was able to kill them or have them in captivity. 
And so the Bible likened that to us being able to have rule in our spirits. For a man that doesn't rule his spirit, what is our spirit? Our spirit is our motivation. Our spirit is that gives us that oomph to do things in life. And so if I can't rule my spirit, if I live a life with the can't help it, then I give the enemy access to put me in captivity. Even though, like we read earlier, God has given us all these avenues of freedom. He's given us all these avenues to be healed and delivered and saved and set free. But it's up to me to maintain that in my life in order to stay free. I have to maintain it. I have to do things in my life. I have to have some accountability in my life in order to have that type of freedom in my life. Amen? Amen. And so even as we hear the word of God today, even as we hear it on Wednesdays, even as we hear it, we know that God has given us instructions of where we're at now and where he wants to take us. He's given us instructions and in things that we have to do. And so I'll say this again. I do remember that even in our younger days or more distant days, just about everybody walked around with notebooks. We're writing stuff down and we're, we're doing this because we wanted to regurgitate what the word of God was. And then we would meet. At, now check this out. Now you just I know we're older now and we have life is different now. I get it. I promise you I do. And some of we have a lot of old heads in here, myself included. But y'all remember when, you know, we had, the, we had Sunday school. We had day service. And then after day service, the majority of us, we eating at the Jones' house. We meeting at the Jones' house, talking about the, the word of God. We talking about the word of God. And then we coming right back to night service again. So we spent all this time. And not only that, then we fellowship with one another. We're talking about the scripture. Did you hear Bishop Jason Day? He was preaching the same thing Bishop was talking about just today in school. You know, we would have those things. We were regurgitating the word of the Lord today. And we were doing, now I understand this. I am guilty. I get sleepy quick now. I get tired. It's just like, I didn't want to go over and sleep. I don't, you know, after all this time. But I think, I thought about it, that even when we went to the Jones, Mrs. Jones, well, she still do that now. She fall asleep. After she get through cooking and stuff, she... Tired. But she's sowing into atmospheres of blessing the saints. And the only reason I'm saying that is because we were putting ourselves in positive environments, reinforcing what the word of God is. Now, we may not do that now, but we can still put ourselves in positive environments that will reinforce what God is saying to us in the place. You understand what I'm saying? Because if we can sit up with Pukanim for two or three hours, surely we can do something else with the saints or to do something that will reinforce the word of God that will that, that will that we can capitalize in the moments where the word of God is not stolen from us as it has been sown into our spirits that day. Amen. And so I just, I have the burden in me this morning, not only this morning, but to share with you this morning, is that, that we put our part in keeping ourselves. Now imagine as we're keeping ourselves. Just, just imagine. That not only, you know, the pastor, the preacher, whoever comes in ready to pursue God, but we have a ministry of hungry people ready to pursue an atmosphere of God like that. We're not coming in here and saying, God, I just need you to deliver me today. I messed up two days ago because I couldn't even keep myself. Imagine us not coming in with an atmosphere like that, but coming in with an atmosphere, God, you're awesome. I thank you because you did kill me. And I did want to mess up but because I love you so much and I kept myself, God. I want to just say I praise you today. I thank you for keeping my mind straight. God, I thank you for keeping my children out of trouble. I thank you for coming in with a heart of praise and thanksgiving and not a heart of crying. And woe is me. Just imagine. Now I know some of this may be a little rough edge, but come on, let's live up to a better standard. You know, that's how I was raised. I was, I told y'all some of the stuff, man. Them people didn't play. Did they? <laughs> but I think I, I'm appreciative of it. I'm appreciative. You know, you ever, you know, some anyway, some of y'all older people, you you know, you had the parents that <clears throat> your mama didn't play. You know, you had the type of mama that you talked back before you knew her hands in your mouth from the back end. That was my mama. 
Oh, my grandma, you know, you, you know, they tried to call you abusive. Now you slap a kid in the mouth. <laughs> we, we were just raised like that. Y'all catching the hand was nothing. You know, I remember my mom, <laughs> you know, I did something. I don't know what I did. My mom said, go in there and get me a shoe. <laughs> she finna whip me or something. And I brought this, this big high heel shoe back, and she just busted out laughing. Cause she said, boy, what you trying to do to get me the key? But... <laughs> But at that moment, I think that little funny moment saved my life. But it didn't take much because if I did something again, they clicked back and, you know, oh, I was raised by those type of aunts and parents and stuff like that. They grabbed the closest thing to you. You know, now that I'm going to call the police, you know, I tell my kids this today. <laughs> I'm willing to go to jail. Uh. I am willing. I like be block. <laughs> <laughs> so if y'all ever get it in you just because you want to call the police, just understand you're going to do it in probably a memorial hospital. Uh -huh. And the reason I'm saying that is because because I did preach it to jail a lot, I would rather be in that father that you don't like than for you to be in some type of trouble and having a father figure in the house and I didn't say nothing. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? I love my kids. I think I do. I have these moments and I'm, I'm about done. But I have these moments with them. And I just be honest with them. I said, am I a good dad? You know, do you, you know, I have these questionnaire moments. I'm like, you know, did I, you know, cause I do work a lot and I feel, sometimes I feel guilty because I'm always doing things and I'll just say, you know, was I there enough for you? You know, are there some things that you wished I could have done, you know, about these, of these moms, especially since their mom and I are not together anymore, you know, I have those moments where I have real conversations, especially that, that they've gotten older. You know, this is just some side lame yap stuff. Uh, I just have those type of conversations because I realize that my input into their lives is short. And Man. I realized so many damaged people uh, because of how childhood it was for them. There are some people that are still dealing with childhood traumas today that happened to them 40, 50 years ago. Does that make sense to you? You know, if I, if I, anyway. But, you know, you have people that deal with those type of things. And so I want to make sure that the gift of fatherhood that I have to be able to impart into my children that is healthy for them, um, that they're able to understand the benefits of uh, living a life that is healthy. I try to have conversations with them that are raw, um, that are open because if they don't learn it from me, they're gonna learn it from the streets or they're gonna learn it from Pookie and Ray Ray now. And at least I can give them some type of biblical principles that it will have some type of standard, you know. Um, and I'm just, preacher kids just, they just catch it all, but I'm gonna say it anyway. But you know, I'd I be so proud, you know, my, me and my daughter, we have our spilling the tea moments. <laughs> You know, when I tell you she had this moment, Dad, I got some tea for you. And, you know, we just sit back and we talk. And I, I appreciate the moment that she has comfortable with me because she talked about a lot of things that's going on with her friends and things like that. And she's like, I'm just proud to say that I don't have no body count. And when she first said it, I was like, I ain't even get it. And I ain't get it. I ain't know what that meant. I'm like, well, body count? You know, Daddy, you know body counts. You know, they've been with a lot of people. I said, oh. Hush, thank you. <laughs> you know, Praise the Lord. So, but being able to have those moments to where you know I'm raising, able to raise a daughter that can respect for herself. I, you know, I have those conversations with her that you know I want you know make it hard. You know, don't be easy for no little boy to come up to you and talk about you know you just pretty. You know, my daddy told me I was beautiful. I, I've been telling my daughter she's beautiful for, since oh, she's a baby, that. and I still tell her tell her that today. So, don't, you know, I want a little boy to just come talk about how she, she knows she's beautiful. You know, she knows she's a beautiful young lady, and I want her to do that because I don't want the enemy to have a foothold because she's broken on the inside because she didn't have a validation of a father in her life to speak well of her. Same with my son. I tell my, my son, if I get sick on me because I go out and kiss on him, you know, after y'all know I'm a very emotional, affectionate person. Y'all don't know. But, you know, all these types of things I do with my children because I want them to have a healthy relationship with their father. Y'all catching it? I want them to have a healthy relationship with their father. 
Just like we need to have a healthy relationship with our Father, He wants to talk to us. He wants to discipline us. He wants to tell us, you said the wrong thing. You need to stop doing this. You need to get away from these people. You need to do this type of thing because when they honor the Father, they like to make me proud. You know, they call me that, you know, they like, you know, I tell them I'm proud of them for doing this. Don't y'all want God to say I'm proud of you? Amen. I'm proud of you for keeping yourself five whole days. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all don't know that's a major feat for some people, you know. You know, sometimes we need to, God kept me for a whole day. Thank you, Shabbat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to get it. You need to celebrate the small victories in your life. Amen. You know, when you didn't allow the enemy to take you over, you have to celebrate those moments because it encourages you to keep on doing better. And it, my daughter has been on honor roll since then. What you call it, the preschool, before she even got to kindergarten. How do you be a valedictorian in your kindergarten class? <laughs> and that's, that was my daughter. And my daughter has maintained that all her life. You know, I told my daughter she's getting ready to graduate. I could talk, I got a couple minutes. She's getting ready to graduate. She told me she was graduating, you know, she's on track to graduate with high honors. I said, baby, ain't nobody in our family ever did that. <laughs> you know. And we forgot to say that she won homecoming queen. You know, so she's, she's, yeah. she's been on track. My son is a great kid. He's a little bit more like his daddy. Yeah. You know, he started on that honor roll track, but now he just maintains a BC <laughs> type of environment. You know, he good, you know, but he's the greatest help. You know, he helps me around the house. He helps me with Paul. Paul. Um, but he does a lot. And the um, only reason I'm saying this is because in order for my house to be healthy, I have to be healthy. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say that one more again and slow it down. Amen. In order for my house to be healthy, yeah, come on. I have to be healthy. Amen. In order for the church Amen. to be healthy, you have to be healthy. I'm going to say this again. I say this all the time. The church is not bishop and lady ranking. Let's not put that weight on them. This is not, they're not responsible for everything. They oversee everything and they make sure we stay on track. But we're all a collective body to carry the weight. My children help me do the things that I do in the house. They make some of the things a little bit easier because they're helping out. They're at the age now. With a Lord, the son got his license for his shaka color. <laughs> my daughter has a license. My, start, my son started working last Friday, first day of work, started working, my daughter working. And why is it exciting? That's a little less burden. Dad don't have to buy the food, you know what I'm saying? So it eases the load. It eases the load when they carry the burden with me. And so, let's, let's call, now, Bishop and Lady Rankin, they're not as animated as I am, but let's call them to say, Shaka Khan. <laughs> I don't have to buy their lunch no more. They can feed themselves. I don't have to produce the atmosphere because they came in with a heart to seek after God. I don't have to lay hands on them because the brothers over here, they got it now. Put me in the game. You understand what I'm saying? And so we live this life that we are coming in with the weight of God's glory on us instead of begging for us to let somebody lay hands on us to get it. That makes sense to you guys? And so I know I put a lot out there. That's a lot of responsibility. But it's one that is deemed them as, as saints of God that we have to live according to. Now, I'm able to talk like this. Do I have everything 100% right in my life? No. But I'm able to preach with this burden because this is where I'm working in. This is the discipline that I'm putting in my life in order to have what God has for my life. I feel myself coming back. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? And so this is what we have to do. You know, a lot of times, if you don't know it, many times when preachers or whoever get out, a lot of times they're preaching things that they're experiencing in their life or have experienced in their life and able to share it. And I'm done. But, you know, I'm one of those people. And I thought about this on the way for some, I think it was some bishop said some time ago, I understood, or I have a thought for my own understanding. The Bible talks about how, you know, it's hard when somebody has been in the church and they fall away, it's hard to get them back. I get it. 
Because I'm thinking like, if I backslid, y'all gonna have to come with dripping ointment off y'all life to get me back. <laughs> Because you know you have those people that think they know it all. You know, I know it, it you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so that's, I, I've, I've talked to a lot of backslidden people and they know it all. They know it and so it's hard for them to come in. And I don't ever want to be in that, that state of having fallen away and then being bitter. You know what I'm saying, being bitter. Because of whatever. So anyway, let's whip the devil, snatch his teeth out today, and live on for Jesus and be happy. Amen. 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 So that's all I have. Do we? <laughs> Anybody have any comments, questions, anything before we? Elder, what I like back in the days that 